Happy Tuesday, everyone. I hope you all had a fantastic Juneteenth holiday weekend. It is top of the hour, and I do want to be respectful of your time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the do's and don'ts when it comes to investing with retirement funds. I'm Renika Lightborn. If you have any questions, uh, definitely feel free to um, enter those in the question box, and we'll, I'll get those answered as we go, and also allocate some time at the very end as well. You have a lot of flexibility when it comes to using a self-directed IRA account to uh, invest in alternative assets. However, the IRS do have some, just a few rules and restrictions that you do have to be mindful of or you do have to be aware of just because of some of the limitations and um, when it comes to certain types of investments, uh, whether it is um, certain persons that your IRA cannot transact with. I'll also cover some of the annual contribution guidelines and um, just a few few of the special tax implications under uh, very specific uh, certain or very specific circumstances um, that may apply to certain investments. Um, you want to ensure that you do not violate any of the uh, self-directed rules and regulations simply because, again, you want to protect the, the tax status, the tax, the tax advantage status of your retirement account. Um, before we get going, I'm going to kind of give you just a high level of self-directing as a whole, and then we'll drill down further into uh, the different rules and regulations to be mindful of. Again, I'm Renika Lightborn, business development professional here at Advanta. I've been with Advanta as an employee since 2019. I'm also an Advanta client as well prior to joining staff. Um, so self-directing is something that I actively, I actively do. If you have specific questions or you want to do a one-on-one -on -one co consultation, uh, feel free to Give me a call, send an email, or uh, visit advanceira.com to schedule a consultation with me. So just a little housekeeping before we get going. At Advanza, we don't give any tax, legal, or investment advice. I just know that all of the information that I'm going to cover today is just educational purposes. Um, so we strongly encourage you to always do your due diligence and consult with your professional team, whether it includes your attorney, your CPA, or financial advisor, before making any investment decisions. So just a little background on, on Advanta and who we are. Uh, we've been in the business for about 20 years now as one of the nation's leading self-directed IRA administrators. Uh, we work very closely with individual investors and investment providers to use retirement funds to invest in alternative assets. And I'll cover some of the, the long list of things that you can, uh, can invest in. Our headquarters is located in Largo, Florida, which is the Tampa Bay area. Advanta has an office in Atlanta, which is where I'm based, but we do work with clients nationwide as we hold a little over $2 billion under our administration. If you're an advanced client and you have cash just sitting idle, uh, just know that the cash is FDIC insured. Uh, once you make an investment, again, you take on the responsibility that you've done your due diligence and you're um, comfortable with that investment. But if it's just cash, it is FDIC insured. Uh, from a personal standpoint, Advanta, uh, we provide you a dedicated account manager that's going to be with you um, for the life of your account with us. That's going to help you dot those I's and cross those T's when you're ready to make that investment. And then, of course, we provide you great educational content, um, which include webinars like this. We also host a um, we have a podcast. My colleague Alex hosts. Uh, definitely feel free to check that out. And we do uh, what's called Pitch Promote Prosper. It's an online uh, networking platform available to, to all of our clients, but also the general public. So I encourage you to visit our website, check out our events page, and um, feel free to attend. So if self-directing is a new concept for you, uh, just remember just three quick takeaways. Any IRA or former employer plan qualifies to be self-directed. And with self-direction, you're always in control. So you choose the investment that works best for you. Again, I'll touch on the few restrictions in terms of the types of investments you cannot do, but outside of that, uh, you're in complete control. And then, of course, any income that's generated from those investments flows back into the retirement account. Any expenses associated with that investment is paid out of the IRA account. So why are IRAs considered an untapped resource? Uh, as of last year, there was about $35 trillion, yes, with a T, um, of money of funds sitting in retirement accounts. That includes IRAs, employer-sponsored plans like 401ks and 403bs and other defined benefit plans. And of that, roughly less than 4% of IRA funds are actually uh, truly uh, self-directed, meaning invested in alternative assets. Um, so most times we have, you know, have funds sitting in those IRAs and those 401k plans, but we're not looking to use those funds until we retire, which can be uh, years away, whether it's five years out, 10 years, 20 years, so forth. So those are additional funds or resources available to you uh, to make uh, to make your next investment. 
And then, of course, again, the gains that's generated from those, uh, those investment that's made in the IRA does not affect your personal tax return. So do keep that in mind. If you've never heard of, heard of uh, self-directing, uh, it's not uncommon, again, because most IRAs are held at the large banks, banks and brokerage firms. Um, you're familiar with the, the fidelities of the world, the Charles Schwab. But in reality, again, the IRS say that you can use your IRA funds to invest in, in other, um, other investments outside of stocks and bonds. So exactly what is a self-directed IRA? Uh, self-directed IRA just gives you, as the account owner, complete control over your retirement funds and the investment decisions, and it gives you the ability to you know, truly diversify your account as you build retirement wealth. It's not just um, dependent on being in the stock market. You, you can use those funds to invest in uh, real estate. It has to be for investment purposes, but you can invest in um, real estate, whether it's a, a fix and flip or a, a you know, buy and hold. You can use IRA funds to invest in uh, tax liens or notes and mortgages. Uh, precious metals is um, a pretty hot topic right now. You can use your IRA funds to invest in um, oil and gas. So the list goes on and on in terms of what's on the table for you. So why do people choose to self-direct? Again, it can be a new source of capital. If you have funds that are sitting um, idle in an old 401k uh, from a job that you left, um, or you have an existing IRA, you can elect to move those funds as opposed to uh, tapping into your personal savings or your rainy day fund or taking out a personal loan. Uh, two, another reason as to um, why someone may self-direct is, you know, again, the ups and downs in the stock market. We don't have any control over that. Yes, the market goes up, the market goes down. But with real estate or some other tangible assets like precious metals, we know it always retains value and it gives you uh, the ability to, again, diversify your account. And then finally, the tax benefits having those rents, those profits, those dividends uh, flow back into your uh, retirement account tax for your tax deferred. Uh, today's session, we're going to talk about, you know, what to, how to adhere to the rules and regulations to make sure that you don't um, violate uh, the IRS rules so you don't want to risk possibly losing um, your tax shelter status. In terms of the different types of accounts that can be self-directed, it's the, the accounts that you're already familiar with. Uh, for individuals, you have traditional IRAs. Uh, with traditional, it's tax deferred. You get the tax break up front. You pay the taxes late. Um, you pay the, you pay the taxes later once you take it out at retirement based on your tax rate at that time. With a Roth IRA, you've elected to pay the taxes up front. You grow the account over time. As long as you've had that account for at least five years and you're 59 and a half, which is retirement age, when you take it out, um, it's tax free. If you are a business owner, have a side business, you know, side hustle, you know, 1099, uh, you can look to self-direct a step, simple or solo 401k. Solo 401k has higher contribution limits and I'll kind of um, drill down into the different contribution limits for uh, the various accounts. And then, of course, if you have um, children or you know nieces and nephews, you can certainly look to open up a an educational savings account to cover any education related expenses that they may have. If you are um, if you have a high deductible health insurance plan, you can look to open up an HSA to cover medical related expenses. I would encourage you to check with your plan provider to make sure that it is a, a, a high deductible plan. And then, of course, any former employer plan. Um, like an old 401k, 403b, or TSP type plan qualifies to be self-directed. Again, the difference is um, distribution for a Roth IRA is tax-free at retirement as long as you've had it for five years. And then, of course, the contribution limits um, varies between the different types of accounts. So now I'm going to focus on, you know, drilling down into the different rules and regulations as it relates to uh, contributions and just, you know, funding your account in general. So when it comes to um, Funding your account, you have several different options, one of which includes making an annual cash contribution. And you do that by as long as you have earned income, so whether that's from a W-2 paycheck, which is you know considered earned income, or if you're a 1099, as long as you have earned income, uh, you can make a, a contribution to your to your retirement account. Um, if you have you know rental income, unfortunately, that is not considered earned income, that's passive income. You can certainly look to work with your CPA to see if you, if you're a property property manager, for example, of your rental property, then you can look to pay yourself in that way to be um, to create earned income. So with retirement um, plans, you know, you can make annual cash contribution, whether it's IRAs or employer sponsored plan. And we'll talk about the actual um, limits uh, shortly. 
So that includes, you know, 401ks and TSPs. As long as you have earned income, you can contribute. Uh, the annual contribution limits is, is in place by the IRS and it determines um, the maximum amount is determined based on the type of account that you have. So for example, if you have a traditional or Roth IRA and you're under the age of 50, you can put in $6,000 a year. If you're over the age of 50, you have that additional $1,000 catch up where you can put in 7,000. If you have a SEP IRA, if you're you know, self-employed, have your own business, you can do a SEP IRA, which allows you to put up to 25% of your, um, your earned income, your compensation, not to exceed 61,000. For a simple IRA, you as an employee can put uh, 14,000. Your employee can match up to 3%. If you're over the age of 50, you have an additional um, catch up of $3,000. If you have a 401k, um, if you have a 401k, you get to contribute as an employee and an employer, and you can possibly put between 61,000 if you're under the age of 50 or 67,500 if you're over the age of 50. Uh, for ESA accounts, you can put in $2,000 per year per child up until they're 18. Uh, for HSA account, for individual plans, you can put in $3,650 for 2022. For a family plan, you can put in $7,300. If you're over the age of 55 for an HSA, then you can put an additional $1,000 um, for individual or family plan. So again, some of the accounts may have additional restrictions in terms of the deposit based on, you know, AGI, like for instance, with a, you know, Roth IRA or income restrictions. Um, so we can, we can drill down, drill on, the, on that more if that applies to your specific scenario. Um, but I would encourage you to speak with your tax advisor to ensure that, you know, you're, you're eligible to make a full contribution to your retirement account, whether it's an IRA or an employer sponsored plan. In addition, you can also fund your account by um, doing a transfer from an existing IRA or doing a rollover from a former employer plan or an indirect rollover. And I'll talk through um, each of those. So if you have an existing retirement account, um, again, you can roll over or you know, transfer from that plan over into your self-directed account with Advanta. Uh, the way you move money will more so depend on the type of account that you're moving money from. So you want to be able to make sure that you're, you know, you're you're following those um you're following the rules and regulations in terms of moving funds and you're not uh, neglecting to adhere to guidelines because again it can affect um it can affect you know it can affect your account so you, you want to make sure that you know if you're moving money from you know an ira you're doing it properly if you're moving money from a former employer plan you're doing it properly and we can help you in terms of filling out the paperwork to do that so as it relates to an IRA transfer, IRA transfer involves um, the same types of uh, retirement account, meaning if you're moving from you know, a traditional IRA at say Charles Schwab, then you're gonna move it over to a traditional IRA here at Advanta. So transfers itself are not, uh, not reported to the IRS because it's not a taxable event to you. You're not taking personal possession of those, uh, those funds. Um, you're not taking a personal distribution. It's going from one qualified retirement account to another. There is no limit in terms of the number of transfers that you can do between IRA custodians. You can move as many as um, you want to or need to to make your investment. For example, let's just say you have an account that has 50,000, but you only need to move 10,000 to make your investment. You make your investment and you get returns that come back you know, quarterly, annually, or if the investment is closed out, you can elect to then move those funds back into your brokerage IRA to go into the stock market if you choose to. Um, so transfers are available for all types of IRA accounts, whether it's a traditional IRA, Roth IRA, SEP, simple, as long as it's an IRA account. Also too, again, you have to uh, transfer between a like-minded account. You can't go from um, you know, Roth to traditional. You have to go to Roth to Roth or traditional to traditional. And then of course, you can take a look at IRS publication 590A, which kind of goes into greater detail as it relates to um, transferring in and out of your account. With um, direct rollovers, again, so you can fund your account by making you know, an annual cash contribution. You can fund your account by making a you know, trustee to trustee transfer. You can also fund by doing direct rollover. A direct rollover is when you move assets out of an employer sponsored plan, such as a 401k, 403b, 457, or a pension plan or TSP plan uh, directly into an IRA account. If the employer sponsored plan is uh, with the past employer, then you can do you can direct those funds to be sent over to your advanced account as well. If the employer plan is with the current employer, 
then there may be restrictions in terms of you not being able to move those funds if you're under the age of 59 and a half. If you're over 59 and a half and you're still employed with that, you know, that company, you can move it at will. But if it's a current employer and you're not 59 and a half, then they most likely would restrict you unless they have a special exception for you to be able to move those funds. Now, in a direct role of a scenario, you would actually have to initiate that request, meaning you reach out to that former employer plan to tell them you want to move the funds over into another qualified retirement account. It is reportable to, um, to the IRS, but again, as long as you're filling out the proper paperwork and you're doing it correctly, there should be no tax liabilities for you to, to move those funds. For indirect rollovers, however, this is you moving funds um, indirectly from, let's just say you're taking personal possession, you move it over from, you know, whether it's an IRA or a former employer plan, you take personal possession of those funds into your personal bank account. Well, at that point, if you do that, that's considered an indirect rollover. You do have um, 60 calendar days to get it back into another qualified retirement account. Um, if you don't, then that's when you'll be subject to, um, you know, taxes or penalties or It'll be considered an early distribution. So you want to be mindful of that. If you take a, um, do a rollover, you do have 60 calendar days to get it back into a qualified retirement account. Uh, the IRS only permits indirect rollovers once for 12 month period. So be mindful of that. Um, these transactions uh, do trigger various tax implications and are typically um, performed in rare circumstances or if it's you know a last minute thing, you want to be um, you want to be mindful of that, but do consult with your uh, proper, you know, tax professional to be, before you actually do an indirect rollover. So now we're going to um, switch gears and talk about uh, prohibited transactions. So again, self-directed IRA provides you a great deal of freedom and choices of um, when it comes to investing in alternative assets, and it puts you in control of your retirement funds. But they are also um, regulated by the IRS in terms of, you know rules that you must be aware of or you must follow to um, to avoid losing that tax deferred start status. And per the IRS rules, there's two types of restrictions with your self-directed IRA. There's prohibited investments and prohibited transactions with uh, disqualified persons. So prohibited investment in an IRA is your IRA cannot invest in uh, life insurance or collectibles or S-corps. Going back to collectibles, collectibles are considered anything like art, antique, rugs, gems, um, coins, stamps with coins. Um, obviously, your IRA can invest in precious metals as long as it meets the, um, the IRS standard in terms of um, the, the quality of, of that metal. If it's, you know, for silver, 99.9% um, and gold, I think it's 99.5%. And then, of course, um, your IRA cannot invest in with collectibles, you know, stamps, wine, any type of alcoholic beverage. With prohibited transaction, so prohibited transaction is, you know, this includes transaction between your IRA and yourself or other disqualified persons, and I'll touch on who, who are considered disqualified persons. So, for example, if your IRA cannot, um, your IRA cannot lend money to a disqualified person or buy an asset that is disqualified um, from a disqualified person. You just want to make sure that you or you know a disqualified person is not receiving any um, personal benefits from that investment. You own your retirement account, you control it, but you have to think of it as own separate person, its own separate entity, it's for later use. So you're not supposed to personally benefit from it today. So, for example, if your IRA owns rental property, uh, you are not permitted to use the property in any manner. It's you know it's for investment purposes only. It's not for personal use. Whether you have a vacation rental and it's available for a weekend, you still cannot use it. And then of course you cannot allow any disqualified person to use that property either. So who are considered disqualified persons? You as the IRA owners considered a disqualified person, your spouse, uh, the IRA lineal descendants like children and grandchildren and their spouses are considered disqualified. The IRA lineal ascendants, parents and grandparents are considered disqualified. Also, uh, any investment advisors or managers or fiduciaries who are providing um, any type of services to the IRA or any entity or corporation or partnerships that the IRA has um, controlling interest in is also considered a disqualified person. And with that, you want to make sure, again, that um, your IRA is on the opposite, if your IRA is on the opposite side of the table from, you know, yourself or your spouse, then, of course, that's where it becomes a prohibited transaction. 
while your brother and your sisters are not considered disqualified persons, you want to make sure that, you know, if your IRA is doing an investment with them is a fair market value. I mean, a fair market, you're not, you know, doing a deal with your sister or your brother below market value. So for example, if you, your IRA has a rental property and you rent it out to your brother, but the rental market in that area is $1,500, but you're rent it, renting it out to your brother for 500, at that point, your IRA is not really benefiting, you're just being a good sibling. So you, again, while you know siblings or you know aunts and uncles are not considered disqualified, if you do transact with them, if your IRA do transact with them, you wanna make sure it's done um, at fair market value. So some consequences for prohibited transaction. Um, again, the IRS has some, while you have a lot of leeway when it comes to self-directing, the IRS does have some severe consequences for IRA owners or the, um, the plan or the persons who are pretending, participating in uh, the IRA's prohibited transaction. Your IRA can possibly be um, subject to um, potential tax in, um, income tax, a 10% early uh, withdrawal penalty, as well as um, potential fines or penalties for not reporting the distribution. And of course, the IRS is permitted to possibly seize the entire value of your IRA to satisfy any taxes and penalties. And that IRA, um, if you were to unfortunately make a prohibited transaction, your IRA could potentially be, cease to be uh, an IRA or retirement account from January 1st of the year in which that um, prohibited transaction uh, was was actually done. So you want to again making sure that you're you're not you're not um, putting your your retirement account at risk. So the IRS outlines and explains IRA publication transaction. You can find that in um, IRS code uh, 4975 or definitely give us a, a, a call if you want to do um, a, a deeper dive on that. So just to kind of recap in terms of prohibited transaction, the four main categories includes um, sale, exchange, leasing of a property between an IRA or disqualified person. Example of that would be you know, renting a property owned by an IRA to your child, extension of credit, or cash alone loan between an IRA and a disqualified person, using IRA funds to invest in you know, your spouse um, business, furnishing of goods and services or facility between the IRA and a disqualified person. Example, if you're personally, if your IRA owns um, you know, a condo or a rental property, if you're personally painting the, that property or you're hiring it out to your son who has a painting company, that's considered, considered a, a prohibited transaction. And then, of course, uh, transfer of IRA income or assets um, to be used by or for personal benefit. Example, if your IRA owns a rental property and it's rental income coming in, and you deposit that income directly into your personal bank account. If you're at retirement age and you take a personal distribution, yes, you can take a personal distribution, but just you know, reach out to us at Advanta to work with your account manager to fill out the proper paperwork to take the, the distribution so we can actually be able to track and report that on the back end. And then, of course, um, again, you want to make sure that you're not jeopardizing the tax for your tax deferred status or something that can be avoided. So, again, touching on key points, no self-dealing, no personal use. It's always for investment purposes only. I'm kind of going to go through some examples of um, prohibited transactions. If your IRA makes a loan, if your IRA makes a loan to your son um, so he can purchase a home, that is considered a prohibited transaction. Your IRA loan make a loan to your son and your IRA holds first mortgage, that is indeed considered a prohibited transaction. Again, your IRA cannot be on the opposite side of the table, meaning borrow, lender, buyer, seller from certain, disqual from certain parties who are considered disqualified. Um, there is a provision in there where you can take up to $10,000 um, from your retirement account, from your, you know, your IRA, um, without being subject to that 10% penalty for a first time home purchase, whether it's for yourself or your children, but that's different in terms of me, you taking out a loan and um, lending it to your son. So again, examples of rental, if you, your IRA owns a condo on the beach, um, you cannot use it for a second home, it has to be for investment purposes. Um, you can rent it out to a third party, you know, to someone who's not considered a disqualified person. You can't use it for a vacation. You can't use it as your primary residence. If you have a retirement, um, if you have, you know, a rental property in your retirement account and you've reached retirement age and you now want to use that property, you can take it out, um, take that property out um, as a personal distribution and um, have access to that property. But it's, if it is in your retirement account, you can't personally use it. Um, so. An example, 
uh, IRA, your IRA buys a house near a campus for fun um, at a specific university and your niece, your daughter and two other students move in and each, you know, sends a check to your IRA for $400 for $400 a month. If the IRA is receiving four different rental checks, it's still considered a prohibited transaction because your daughter is involved in that transaction. So a next example of a prohibited transaction, uh, your IRA loans, um, loans money to a real estate investment company in which you are you know, the sole manager or president or you have controlling interests or you can influence um, the decision at that company, then yes, that is considered a prohibited transaction. If you're the person that's signing the promissory note um, to the IRA on behalf of the company, then yes, while you may not, personally, you know that you may not do anything, um, you may not have any intent of doing anything illegal, but in the eyes of the IRS, it's it's standard across the board for, for everyone. So it's not that they're you know picking on you personally that you will do something um, improper, but it's just you know, the rules that's across the board. If you you can't have controlling interests in a company and be the decision maker because you can influence the, in, the outcome that can affect, um, that can benefit yourself or your IRA. So recapping um, some of the some of the rules, you must have a custodian or a trustee like a Danta IRA to hold the account. And again, we help you with dotting those I's, crossing those T's, T's, making sure that you're doing stuff in compliance. We don't give you any tax or legal investment advice, but you can certainly, if you have questions or you're unsure about something, you know, give us a call and we'll talk through that and let you know, hey, well, these are the IRS rules, these are the guidelines, and then give you the information to help you make an informed decision before you potentially make a prohibited transaction. Um, so, IRA custodians must be approved, um, must be IRS approved custodians to which we are. You cannot borrow from the plan. You can borrow from a, a solo 401k. That's one of the special provisions in a solo 401k. But if we're talking about IRAs, you cannot borrow from, take out a loan from your IRA. Also, you cannot pledge your IRA as collateral for any purposes. So a lot of times you will see um, if you're doing it a personal deal, they'll ask you if you have retirement accounts. Well, you cannot technically pledge your IRA as collateral to to make an investment. Also, a debt finance property um, held by IRA must be a non-recourse loan, and I'll talk about that in a later slide. And then, of course, um, you can roll over assets from your IRA once a year if you're doing a, an indirect rollover, but you do have 60 calendar days to get it back into that retirement account. And then, of course, um, depending on the state um, that you're in, you may have um, creditor protection for your IRA. So different states have different rules. IRAs are considered, you know, state trust accounts. So just be uh, be mindful of that. Uh, some other considerations when dealing with brothers and sisters and other family members. Again, you want to make sure it's at fair market value. You're not doing a sweetheart deal or just being, you know, a good sibling. You want to make sure that you're putting your IRA um, or your retirement account. Um, you're making the best decision for the retirement account. And also, too, not that you would, but you don't want to use a middleman to kind of circumvent or sidestep the rules. For example, your sister or your brother may not be considered a disqualified person, but what you don't want to do is lend the money to your, your sibling and then have your sibling turn around and lend it to your parents. Because at that point, the IRS is going to look and say, well, hey, what was your intent? Was your intent always to get it to mom and dad? And at that point, again, you in their eyes, you would have committed a, a prohibited transaction. Also, too, you want to be mindful that you're not having your IRA lend to a friend and then your friend's IRA lend to your IRA at that point is considered a wash and again what was the intent if you're lending the exact dollar amount then they're going to look at that and then also to having an IRA that lend money on a note and then having that note secured by collateral um, by collectibles while you can do that the issue becomes is if that loan is so I mean if that put the loan or the the lend the borrower defaults and the collectible is the collateral, well, your IRA can't hold a collectible. So you have to be mindful or, you know, think ahead of, okay, if this particular loan or note is secured by a collectible and this person defaults, what is the recourse? So you want to make sure that you're thinking through that because again, your IRA can't hold any collectibles. And I, I touched on the, what those collectibles are, which includes um, anything like, you know, art, wine, stamps, anything of that nature. Again, recapping, IRA purchase a piece of real estate from your son, that's prohibited, opposite sides of the table. If your father IRA lends money to you or your son, that's considered um, a prohibited transaction. Again, think borrow a lender. Um, if your IRA, you know, puts down, if your IRA um, 
puts down a down payment on a property, you cannot personally guarantee any loan or you know mortgage or anything if your IRA is involved because again, your IRA is its own separate entity. We'll talk about non-recourse loan, meaning if you want to use leverage, you can take out a loan specifically for um, IRA accounts, but you can't personally guarantee it. Okay, so next we're going to talk about fair market value. Um, you may hear it referred to as um, FMVs. So the IRS do require that all IRA owners or account owners um, report the fair market value of assets held in their accounts at the end of each year. So um, the IRS requires that every retirement account, not just referring to self-directed accounts, but you know your brokerage account as well, um, do fair market value. And typically this is, is done at uh, the values must be assessed um, as of December 31st of the reporting year. So for you know 2021, it would have been December 31st. And of course, you want to you want to be able to assess the worth of the asset based on you know the actual market value and not the cost of the the actual asset. So the the value may have fluctuated since you made the initial investment. I'm going to kind of go through some frequently asked questions that tend to come up as it relates to um, fair market value. We encourage you, you know, when you do FMVs, obviously reach out to us just to kind of get clarity on you know the type of assets you have in your account we encourage you to talk with your tax professional to ensure that you know you're completing and reporting you're completing um the, the form that we send you that advanta sends you properly as it relates to valuating um, assets that may be in your retirement account so some of the frequently asked questions that we get about fair market value is you know do i have to provide an fmb for each asset in your plan yes you must you must have an fmb um, for each asset so, for example, if your IRA owns, you know, let's just say, three rental properties, then you, you would have to do three F&B for each property. Another question that typically comes up is, um, I able to assign the value of, um, am I able to assign the value to my, um, to my own assets? You may be able to do the F&B form, like assess it yourself. But for certain assets, you do require an independent or a neutral party or a third party, um, someone who's not considered a disqualified person um, to you can can help you with assessing FMB. You can you know consult with a a professional. You can consult with let's just say an attorney or a CPA, a financial planner to help you with with certain FMB forms. If you're doing real estate. Uh, you can have a real estate professional or certified property appraiser or a tax county um, assessor or a, li a licensed real estate professional help you with um, assessing the value of uh, a property that you may hold in your IRA. So next question is, who pays the cost of uh, valuations on assets that may be in your account? If there's a third party or a person that you're working with that's completing the valuation and they're charging you a fee for that service, then of course in this scenario your IRA must pay the cost for the valuation because this, this will be considered an, an expense related to your account. So you're not allowed to personally pay for that, that F&B uh, service fee if there is one. With personal funds you would have to use it, uh, funds from your retirement account. And then of course next question is who sends the F&B to the IRS? Again, you're responsible for um, reporting, well, not re you're responsible for filling out the valuation form in terms of assessing uh, the value of that particular asset. You would provide that over to us at Advanta and we would actually report that to the IRS on your behalf. Um, Advanta will submit the, the FMV form on the 5498 form. We typically get that out to you um, in January and then we ask you to, to have to get it back to us at least by March 15, just to give us adequate time to to do the reporting and get that information to properly file it over to the IRS um, based on on their deadline or based on the account type. But typically, it's May 31st. And then, of course, um, when compiling information relevant to a fair market value, when when compiling information relevant to a fair market fair market value form, we require again each asset. And your each asset in your account it has its own um, its own FMB form based on the value at the end of the year, the pre December 31st. Each form must be signed by you as the account owner and the qualified person who's performing the valuation. If you're not, you know, if you're performing the valuation yourself, then obviously you're signing on behalf as the evaluator. But if you have like a, a real estate professional or an investment provider that's doing the valuation for the asset, then you want to have them sign off on that document. And if you have any other supporting documents, whether again it's a, 
property appraisal or it's a tax assessor value or it's a balance sheet, whatever you have, you will provide it over to us, submit it with the FMV form, and then advance would, um, would report that to the IRS on form 5498. So I had a question come in. Yeah, so um, there, this is recorded. It will be up on our website uh, within 24 to 48 business hours, and also you will get a copy of the slides. So next we're going to talk about um, UBID and UDFI, so unrelated business income tax, unrelated debt finance income tax, and this is what a non-recourse um, loan scenario comes in. Uh, my colleague Corey uh, did a, a deeper dive in terms of a deeper dive in, in terms of a webinar on, on UDFI, UBID. So if you have questions or if we don't cover everything in this um, in this section, definitely feel free to check that out. So unrelated uh, business income tax. It, it applies more so to um, you know business income and not investment income. It can apply if you're doing you know a syndication or a private equity type investment. Unrelated debt finance income tax applies to income when you use you know leverage or you use loan to purchase real estate specifically in an IRA. And I'll talk about an example in an IRA and an example in a solo 401k. So UBIT tax is you know what your your self-directed IRA account may occur may incur when your IRA receives uh, unrelated business income due to ownership in a business that's not taxed as a C corporation. If it's taxed as a, as a C corporation, then it doesn't, um, then you would, your IRA wouldn't be subject to the UBIT tax. It earns, if it earns um, any type of unrelated debt finance income from revenues like rents and proceeds from the sales of an investment that has outstanding debt. So let's go, um, go over some things to consider with uh, UBTI, unrelated um, business tax income. So if your self-directed IRA invests in a business and receives pre-tax profits instead of post-tax profits or dividends, then that's considered UBTI, so unrelated business tax income. If income made by a business your IRA actually owns or operates in, if income that your IRA receives from assets held within a business, whether it's a, a corporate, um, an entity like an LLC or a partnership, and they didn't pay uh, business tax on the profits before distributing that income. With C-Corps, like, you know, C-Corporations, it pays business tax. So if your IRA is not, uh, if your IRA is investing in a business that's not a C-Corp, then that's what, when it could potentially be subject to, subject to uh, UDF, U, UBIT tax. So how does an IRA earn um, UDFI? So when a portion of your investment in your IRA purchase, let's just say, or it finances um, real estate. Example, a property is 100,000, your IRA put down uh, 30, you know, 30,000 and you take out a non-recourse loan. Non-recourse loan just means that your IRA is not personally guaranteeing that loan. They're not looking at you as an individual, they're just looking at the property itself to make sure it's cash flowing. They lend you, the, um, they provide the loan to you for let's just say the remaining balance of 70,000, you fix that property up and you sell it. 30% of the profits that flows back into the IRA is not subject to any taxes. However, 30, the 70% that you leverage, that you use loan, would be subject to what's called UDFI tax, unrelated debt finance income tax. So again, Again, you can use leverage to purchase real estate, but the, the loan type itself would have to be considered a non-recourse loan. Uh, the percentage the percentage of net profit credited back to your account is tax sheltered. Again, it's based on the amount that your IRA puts down, but the portion that is, um, that's leveraged would be subject to that UDFI tax, unrelated debt finance income tax. You can work with your CPA or attorney to try to um, kind of you know, limit or get some depreciation on on that property or on that investment to um, offset that tax liability. Obviously, as you repay that loan, you, the UDFI tax goes away. But if you have a good CPA that's familiar with UDFI, UBIT, they can work with you too to kind of help offset by doing some some depreciation on that specific tax. I had another question. Can you just bear with me one moment? Okay, so the question is, so if I decided not to invest in real estate, which was the reason for opening the direct self-directed IRA, how do I transfer the money back into the account, which it came from? It's pretty straightforward. 
uh, whichever brokerage firm you um, the money originally came from, let's just say it's Charles Schwab, you would go to Charles Schwab, fill out their transfer form, and then of course they would Charles Schwab would then send it over to Advanta, and then Advanta would uh, send the money back over to your your Charles Schwab account based on whatever dollar amount, whether it's the entire amount that you're be moving back over or just a portion. So it would be a trustee to trustee transfer. You just have to indicate with them how much you're looking to to get moved back over. Question is. So if I purchase a home with my Roth IRA and got financing, what are the taxes that need to be paid? So that goes back to um, the non-recourse loan scenario. If you have a Roth IRA, even if you had all of the money to purchase the property outright and you didn't want to use all of that money in that specific investment, but let's just say again, the property is 100,000 and you had you put down 30,000 from your Roth IRA or 20,000, whatever amount that you put down and you take out a loan for the remaining balance, let's just say you took out $70,000 loan. If you're a non-recourse loan, you have to go to a specific lender that offers non-recourse loans. If you need that list, definitely feel free to reach out to me. We have a comprehensive list of non-recourse lenders. They're not looking at your personal credit or anything like that. They're just looking at the property, the investment itself, and they'll tell you what their rates and their terms are. Again, they may require that you put down 30%. The portion, the 70% in this scenario, would be subject to that UDFI tax. So that's the portion relating to what your IRA would pay back. So if it's a rental property, you know, as the rental check come in, you'll pay the portion towards that, um, that non-recourse loan as that loan is paid off. As that loan is, as that loan is paid off, then of course, um, the, the UDFI tax goes down. But again, this is where you would reach out to your, your CPA to see if they can provide you some some depreciations or some strategies to kind of help you offset that, that UDFI tax. Okay, so moving right along. So um, some, some things to consider with uh, UBIT, um, UBIT. So again, it does not apply to investments in, in C corporations, as C corporations pay taxes at, at a corporate level and then pass dividends to shareholders, um, interest rents, let's just say from a property that doesn't have any debt or royalties or dividends um, received from Investments are not subject to the uh, UBIT tax. Uh, UBIT is um, is not is not a personal tax. Your IRA pays it. If your IRA your IRA has its own tax ID, so you're not using your social or anything like that, and it's filed on Form um, 990T. If the UBIT tax is less than a thousand dollars, then you don't have to file it. But if it's a thousand dollars or more, then yes, you do have to file that 990T. Again, your CPA or tax person can help you with with filing that form. Uh, UBIT tax rates uh, follows uh, trust tax rate schedule, which is 37%, up to 37%, not your individual income tax bracket. Um, there may be some exceptions in terms of um, if your IRA sells property that has you know, outstanding debt. But again, this is where you want to work with a, a CPA that's very familiar with UBIT and UDFI. Uh, I had another question. Just bear with me one moment. Um, question is... Where do you find specific IRS guidelines for purchasing a home with financing? As it relates to um, UBID or UDFI, you can go to IRS Publication 598. Um, IRS Code specifically 512, I think, explains um, the UBID income, and IRS Code 514 explains UDFI. So you can go to IRS Code or IRS Publication 598 relating to, to UBID tax. And then, of course, you want to you know, be able to consult with your accountant or your tax professional that's familiar with, with UDFI or UBIT. So I'll touch on, there's multiple ways you can reduce or avoid uh, UBIT. Again, your licensed you know, CPA or accountant who, who are familiar with it can, can be a better, um, better service to you. With. I'll, I'll just highlight on uh, a couple ways you can reduce or avoid UBIT tax. So, you can avoid it by, you know, don't allow your IRA to use leverage to fund real estate, um, a specific real estate. You can um, UBIT or UDFI, would, UDFI in this scenario, when it comes to real estate, would only apply if you're using debt leverage or debt finance to, to purchase property. In a solo 401k, I didn't provide this early, but in, a, in an IRA, yes, you're subject to UDFI tax. In a solo 401k, you're, you're not subject to UDFI tax. You're still subject to UBIT tax if your solo 401k is investing in a business, but if your solo 401k is, invest, is investing in real estate, that's not subject to UDFI tax. So let's go back to the same example. 
property is 100,000, you're still a 401k, you put down 30,000, you still take out that non-recourse loan, meaning you're not personally guaranteeing that loan. Take a, get a loan for the remaining 70,000, you fix the property up and you sell it, 100% of the profits flow back into that solo 401k without being subject to UDFI tax. So that's one of the added benefits of solo 401ks that a lot of real estate professionals uh, like. You have to be eligible for a solo 401k as long as you have earned income, whether it's a, um, like you have earned income from your business, I'm sorry. So whether you're a 1099 or you have an entity set up and not have any employees, or if you have employees, they have to be under the age of, under the age of 21, have not worked for you for three years consecutively and not work more than a thousand hours. So that's a, another uh, benefit to a solo 401k that an IRA doesn't provide. Um, again, you can use a solo 401k as it, it doesn't, um, it's not subject to the UDFI tax as a way to avoid UBID or UDFI tax. Uh, you can partner your IRA funds uh, with cash from, from yourself or other investors in terms of you know, doing deals as long as you're on the same side of the, the retirement account. If, if you're the person, if, you, if your IRA and you know, your, let's just say your company and your IRA is buying 123 Main Street, it's perfectly fine to do it as long as you're both sitting on the same side of the table as buyers. It only becomes a, um, a prohibited you know, transaction if you're on the opposite side of the table, if your IRA is involved. So let's just say instead of taking out a loan, if you have personal you know, money in your personal you know, bank account or your business account, and you have money in your retirement account, you can put those funds together and purchase, you know, make that investment. The key with that though you wanna remember is whatever the IRA or the 401k puts in, it gets back. So let's just say you did a 50-50 split by partnering with yourself in your retirement account. If the IRA put in 50% of the money, it's gonna get back 50% of the profits, pay 50% of the expenses. The profit that's flowing back into the retirement account is not subject to any capital gains. However, the portion that's coming back to you, you will be responsible for any um, capital gains taxes in that scenario. So another way to reduce or avoid uh, UBIT tax is if you um, if you pay down the debt and the leverage quickly uh, with profits from other IRA investments that can kind of help you with you know mitigating some of those um, those UBIT taxes. Again, talk to your CPA to see what strategy um, best work in your scenario. So question is why is IRA subject to UBIT but as a solo 401k not? I've always thought them as roughly the same. So no, your IRA and your 401k are both subject to UBIT, unrelated business income tax, meaning your IRA or your solo 401k and invest, invest in a business, then yes, it is subject to UBIT tax. UBIT and UDFI um, is used interchangeably, but there is a slight difference. So UBIT is if your retirement account, whether it's IRA or 401k, is investing in a business, and both are so subject to UBIT tax. However, UDFI, unrelated debt finance income tax, which falls underneath UBIT, um, sometimes it's overlooked, it applies in a real estate scenario. So UDFI, unrelated debt income, debt finance income. So let's just say, again, you want to buy real estate in your retirement account. If it's an IRA, you're subject to UDFI tax, unrelated debt finance income tax. If you do it in a solo 401k, that's one of the added benefits or perks with a solo 401k where that UDFI tax does not apply. So sometimes the terms may be used, UBIT and UDFI may be used interchangeably, but there is a difference. So debt, just think of um, debt finance when it comes to real estate. I hope that helped with um, clarifying. If not, definitely feel free to give me a call and we can kind of talk through some more examples. Again, for UBIT, uh, you can check out IRS publication uh, 598 for, for that. I know I talked about a lot of the, the rules and restrictions um, that the IRS has in place and you want to make sure you're not risking that the tax, tax deferred status for your account by you know, not following those rules. Um, outside of that, that's why, again, so we're here to help you um, guide you through this process. Despite there being a few restrictions or if this is a new concept for you, may, you know, may be a lot of information all at once, but definitely feel free to reach out to us and we can guide you through it. If it's a UBIT um, tax scenario or, you know, we, we've had um, instances where, you know, someone may, may see, you know, UBIT tax may be applied uh, to an investment and that may deter them, or it may be you know, something that they strongly consider not what, a reason as to why they wouldn't want to do the investment, but I would tell you, um, if the numbers have to confirm with your CPA and you know, kind of getting a full understanding of the investment that you're making, 
if it's, it's not a penalty, it's not a, um, a personal thing against you, but if the numbers for that investment still make sense, you may, you know, you still want to consider and do that deal. Okay, so a question came up in terms of my self-directed IRA owns an LLC. I have checked for control um, over as a member. The EIN is under my name. The EIN um, should be in the name of the LLC and not in your name. The LLC is regis registered under my, your name. In that scenario, the LLC, so the process for setting up LLC, you open up your account, you fund your account, and then you go open up a brand new LLC, not one that you personally, you know, personally own, currently own, it has to be a brand new LLC. You can act as a manager or you can have someone else act as manager, but you can't, um, you're not the owner of that entity. So it has to be owned um, by the actual IRA. And when you draft that operating agreement document, the operating agreement document will show that your IRA is the owner, meaning advanced IRA, FBO, John Smith, IRA 123. That lets the IRS know when this LLC goes out and buy, you know, 123 Main Street, don't come after you personally because you don't own it. It's owned by your retirement account, which is tax sheltered. So you may want to um, reach out whichever custodian that you're currently working with, uh, reach out to them to see if you can, you know, make those corrections. It should be in the name of your, um, the EIN should not be in your personal name. The company, you should not be the owner of that actual entity. You can act as manager currently, um, but you're not the owner of that LLC. So definitely either reach out to us afterwards or um, whoever the custodian is for your, your current account. Um, so again, I touched on the few rules to be mindful of. Don't let it you know, stop you with, with self-directing. It's, it's been around for a very long time. Um, we hope that it continues to be around for a long time. And our role here is to kind of educate uh, the general public. Again, less than 4% of accounts are actually self-directed. So there's so, um, a great, you know, great opportunity for all of us to kind of implement this strategy and and make it a part of your your wealth building, your retirement wealth building um, building plan. Um, earlier, I touched on you can use IRA funds to invest in, in single family homes, whether it's you know short term or a fix and flip project. But you can also use IRA accounts to, you know, pretty much you have a, a blank canvas. You can use funds to invest in you know vacant land, parking garage, mobile homes. If you're um, uh, wholesale, you can do assignments. You do want to be mindful of the amount of um, wholesale transactions you're doing a year, but there's still an opportunity to start if you have a smaller uh, dollar account. Uh, you can invest in, um, you can do private lending on microloans. You can invest in oil and gas on mineral rice. You can, you know, invest in water rice, billboard signage. You can do uh, movie production. You can do crowdfunding. Uh, manufacturing plans, hotels and hospitals. Um, I have a, a client that's, you know, purchasing a, hospital, um, a hotel in his retirement account. Um, so the list goes on and on in terms of what's what's available to you. You can, if you're comfortable with, um, you know, oil and gas, if that's your background, then, you know, use that skill set to, to, to do it in your, replicate that in your IRA. If you're interested in precious metals, use that skill set to replicate it in your IRA. So you have uh, a long list of different things. This is not a, a comprehensive list, but I just wanted to provide you some additional things that you can do in your retirement account. And let's see, I think I have a another question, but before I do, I just want to touch on, again, with self-direction, you're in control. It not only allows you to invest in what you know, but also whom you know. So if you're part of a, a local um, you know, network or a real estate group, definitely know that you can leverage, you know, your contacts, your resources to do deals and, and grow your retirement account. When you're looking to get started with us, because I know we're top of the hour, um, just, you know, three simple steps. You can open up your account by filling out uh, the paperwork electronically via DocuSign. Uh, we can guide you through that, you know, pretty quickly. We'll pair you up with an account manager who's going to be with you for the life of your account with us. You get to fund your account um, several different ways. Again, you can make that annual cash contribution in accordance with the uh, contribution limits based on the type of account that you have. You can transfer from an existing IRA from like account to, to like account, trustee to trustee transfer. You can do a direct rollover or indirect rollover from a former employer plan like an old 401k or 403b. And then finally, step three is start investing. What is it that you have an interest in? Is it real estate? Is it notes and mortgages? Is it, you know, rental property? Is it short-term rentals? Um, the list goes on and on in terms of what's on the table for you. So question is, are the slides, um, 
able to be downloaded for future reference? Can you also tell us uh, the event fee? So we don't charge any commission or, um, or anything like that. It's a flat administrative fee. It's really three main fees. One time fee of $50 to open your account. You'll have a transaction fee when you buy or sell. That transaction fee will depend on the type of investment. And then you have an annual record keeping fee with us to um, it's option one, asset base, option two, value base. You can go to our website and uh, take a look at our application. It'll have the, the actual um, fee schedule uh, built into it. And then other fees related only if you use those fees. So for instance, if you say you want us to wire, uh, we incur a wire fee, we would pass it on to you. If you want us to express mail something, you know, just like you would go to a post um, to like a FedEx or something like that, we incur a, a mailing fee or overnight fee, so we would pass it on to you. But the three, there's really three main fees, opening fee, transaction fee, and annual record keeping fee. And then of course, again, uh, we encourage you to continue to um, visit our advantiary.com, check out our events page, continue to attend our webinars, seminars, uh, networking events, and of course our webinars are recorded. It's uploaded onto our video library and our YouTube channel. And then of course our blog has um, great content relating to the latest news and trends in the industry. Let's see if I have any other questions. So how frequently does an asset needs to be valued such as real estate while in a self-directed account? So it's done annually, once a year. So um, as of December 31st of that reporting year, so for you know 2021 it would be, we need to do uh, an FMB, a fair market value for as of December 31st of 2021 for, the, for however many assets you have in your account. So if you only have one asset, one property, one whatever investment you do an FMV. We typically get that form out to you in January and then we ask that you get it back to us by March, mid-March, just so we can um, have adequate time to report to the IRS. But yeah, it's um, once a year for each asset. So if you have an account and you have you know three or four investments, then you're going to do you know an FMB form for each asset. I think that covers um, with all the questions. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to um, to join today's webinar. Again, this will be on our, our YouTube channel shortly within 24 to 48 hours. So it says, what happens if we don't get valuations? Uh, can we use comps? So yes, you can, um, again, you can, whether you have a, a real estate professional that's helping you with it, or if you're doing a property appraisal or a tax assessor value, like you can pull directly from, you know, your county's um, tax website, any other supporting documents, you are required to um, do FMBs, you know, each year. If you don't, then advance as an administrator, as a custodian, possibly have the ability to, um, you know, close out your account, send you your, your assets and close out your account because it is required by the IRS to do um, FMBs on an annual basis. Again, um, question is, in that scenario, I would definitely tell you to um, any anything related to taxes, um, confer with your your CPA for for specific tax advice. Unfortunately, in our role, we we don't give you any type of investment or tax advice. Um, investment goes up, investment goes down. So if you make an investment, you know, at a certain point and it goes down, then you re, you would you know fill that out, relate that on the BFMD form. So. Thank you, everyone. Um, happy investment. Happy, happy, happy investing. Definitely feel free to um, give us a call if you have any questions or, or want to uh, get started with your account.